Welcome again, saints. It is your dearest, dearest servant, Brother Dale of the St. Mark Baptist Church in Waterloo, Iowa. Coming to you with Lesson 11, uh, February 12, 2023, Unit 3, God's Call and Its Responsibilities, Trust and Encouragement. Devotional reading is John 15, 1 through 14, and the background scripture is 2 Timothy 1, 3 through 14, and the print passage is 2 Timothy 1, 3 through 14, and the key verses hold fast the form of sound words which you have heard of me in faith and love, in, uh, which is in Christ Jesus. And before uh, certainly we get to uh, the lesson uh, aims today, I'm going to read the NIV version. What you have heard from me, keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. And uh, today when we, uh, the lesson aims uh, says, examine the holy calling of Paul and Timothy since the reassurance that is given to God, uh, given to those whom God calls. Identify and receive the good treasure that God entrusts. Let's deal with the sense of reassurance that uh, is given to those who God calls before we get to the introduction. And saints today, um, we so often in our churches, we associate the call with just uh, the delivery of the gospel or ministers or preachers or pastors or whoever that is. But that is not the reality. The, the reality is when God, when God gives us, obviously he equips us, he calls us, and then uh, those things that he wants us to do, he's already pre-gifted us with, and it's just a matter of him extracting those things for his service. So whether it's a gift of knowledge, whether it's a gift of healing, whether it's the gift of tongues, the interpretation of tongues, wisdom, whatever that gift is uh, that God has given you, he has called you to exercise that in his service. Again, we want to uh, move away anyway of thinking the call. Oh, they called. And and when somebody, and you you know it, if I tell you, I said, uh, sister or brother, they're called. What are you going to think immediately? Called to preach. Well, we're all called, uh, you know, that doctrine of predestination is not doctrine. It's actually true to do something, a uh, call to exercise some gift that God has given us. And that's the way that we want to think about that is called uh, to get, uh, to use that gift in the furtherance of God's service. And something else that I want to dig into is when we talk about call, we can't get call confused with platform. Again, I want to say that we can't get call uh, uh, confused with platform because when God calls us to do something, he gives us and positions us strategically in places to walk out those gifts. Now, you know what I'm talking about here. For instance, uh, this is something that needs to be said, and I want to be as clear as possible and as contextual as possible with this, is the Bible talks about before he formed us in the belly, he knew us. And before uh, he brought us forth out of our uh, mother's womb, he sanctified us and ordained us. And I'm talking to prophets. He says that to us. I get that. But what we what we have to realize is that the gifting is in the preaching. The Bible says, I have anointed you this day. This is what he said to one of the prophets. Um, so when we talk about that anointing to preach the gospel, to bring glad tidings of good things, that is the call. The platform oftentimes are, is street corners. Uh, it could be Bible studies. It could be preaching. So what I'm saying is, or pastoring, let's just use pastoring because I think that's something we can all uh, be familiar with. The anointing is not in the pastoring. The anointing is in the preaching. Because here's another thing about this you have to understand with God's trust and encouragement and our reassurance in the call, which is right here, is that people can remove you from the platform, but they can't re remove the anointing. The only one that can remove your anointing is God, right? And what I have found out is that when people so often, I, I spoke to you know, some brothers and they're removed and they're not pastoring or some of them like walk off their post. Like they just walk off and they never even make it back. And, and they're, they're living in a place of woe or sorrow is once that platform is removed, people get confused that the platform or the pastoring is the anointing. When the anointing is in the preaching, these people fall into depression because they no longer have the platform because they confuse platform and call. So whatever that thing is for you, or even if it's like a job, you know, a lot of caregivers go into nursing or they go into being a doctor or, or, or something such as that. They go into those things. But even if you get a nursing degree, a PhD doctor or a medical doctor, MD, or whatever that is, that is not the anointing. The anointing God gives you is to love on and care for people. So you walk that out on the platform 
of, of providing people with their medical needs. Some people are just born teachers and they teach students in schools. And But it, they, the, the anointing isn't in a job. The anointing is the gift of teaching because people can remove them from the teaching job. They can go get another one. But they can't remove the love and the gifting of teaching. So all I'm saying is when God, uh, you have to have reassurance that uh, that is given to those that God calls that people may be able to remove the platform, but they cannot remove the anointing. The next identify and receive the good treasure that God entrusts. And I want to stick to that uh, is identify and receive the good treasure as certainly the results of our gifts, which are fruits of the spirit. Don't get it twisted, right? Fruits of the spirit are often from gifting. But here's the thing about fruits of the spirit. Whatever you're gifting, they're requirements, right? Uh, yeah. And, and here's, I was, uh, a bishop spoke a word to me and he said, you know, Dale, I realize that God has given you a John the Baptist style ministry, but that doesn't relieve you of having to um, demonstrate fruits of the spirit. So our gifts should produce fruit, certainly. But it isn't like, a, a, let me give it a, a person with the gift of knowledge, the gift of wisdom, the gift of healing, tongues, whatever that gifting is, all of them collectively have to demonstrate the fruits of the spirit. Oftentimes they just demonstrate it in different ways. Again, some people will hold hands. I mean, they're just gifted with holding people's hands and loving on them. You know, pastors have got hearts, real ones, have hearts full of grace. They just do. Uh, and the other ones, they pretend, but real pastors have hearts of grace, right? Because that's God's love. But God sends others that uh, have this ministry of chastisement. You would know them as prophets. We talked about the threats of the prophets, right? In the previous few weeks, they're known as prophets. But the Bible says, uh, the Bible says, cast all your cares upon him for he cares for you. And that's that hand holding kind of thing. Then the Bible also says to those he loves, he chastises. And y'all ain't got to wait directly on God to chastise you because God sends uh, people to do that as well. So when we talk about the good treasure, the good treasure has to be a result. Uh, it comes from, it start begins with the salvation, sanctification. Then we're talking about understanding giftings and we're talking about uh, demonstrate fruits of the spirit and then the results of the fruits of the spirit, right? So that's what we're talking about there. In the introduction, the simple saying, each one, reach one, summarizes the message of disciples and others winning new believers and leading them on to victory and maturity in Christ. Uh, God has created us to touch the lives of others through relationships, friendships, fellowship, and other human connections. Again, the, the, the big lesson, before I go to the biblical text, the big lesson today, saints, is, is simply this, is that God, yeah, God said it's not good for Adam to be alone, so create and help me. When Adam sinned, and we, why do we suffer for the sins of people that came before us? Because sin because sin is one of those things that's so grievous to God uh, that when we understand how grievous it is, and I'm not even saying I do, um, but when we do try to get to that place anyway, understand it's so grievous to God, we understand it affects everybody around us and those to come. Sin literally permeates us. And that is friendship, fellowship, and all of those things like that, uh, that we have to understand. Remember the call work. Uh, this is 2 Timothy uh, 1, 3 through 6. NIV says, I thank God whom... I serve as my ancestors did uh, with clear conscience and day. I constantly remember you in my, I constantly remember you in my prayers. This is Paul. And verse four says, recalling your tears, I long to see you so I may be filled with joy. I reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to, uh, to fan and to flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. And it says, Paul expressed gratitude as he prayed frequently for Timothy, his son in the faith, who was a leader in church. And one thing that you found out, if we take a, like a, a huge macro view or a huge view, did you ever notice that Paul began all his letters with, with greetings? And the important lesson here is to remember the call and work and trust and encourage. Um, trust and encouragement is important. And that is Paul always necessarily opened his letters with encouragement. Now, sometimes like as soon as he was done in the next verse, he lit people up. The church of Galatian is one of those instances where he's like, oh, hey, guys, how you doing? Lord loves you. You fools. Right. So read a book of Galatians chapter one and work through that. But I'm seeing that 
is when we remember the call and work, we remember that we have to be an encouragement to another, one another. Now, I want to make sure again that you understand encouragement because a lot of you have been deceived and you've been, you've received bad teaching about what love really is. On one hand, we say, yeah, my mama whooped my tail. The woman that loved me the most, the man that loved me the most would discipline me more than anybody else. And then on the other hand, we are now taught that that sort of judgment and carrying out of discipline is wrong. Well, I'm grown. Really? Are you sure about that? What are you, have you read the book of first John where, where the writer refers to grown believers as you little children? Not in God's eyes you aren't. So I'm saying that so you all remember that God loves us. Sometimes it's this, a pat on the back, man, A. Hey, you know, it's uh, God is in control. And Paul opened in this letter. I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers. I greatly desire to see you uh, when I recall your faith that was undefiled. Paul was encouraging him. But you have to remember the same Paul encouraged him in rebuke as well. And we've been taught not to judge, not to say this and that when scripture says something totally different. Right. But the reason becomes the challenge becomes is why are we doing what we are doing? So I'm saying that to point out before I move on to the what do you think saint here is when we talk about greeting people, you have to establish the foundation of relationship before you ever kind of get to the discipline part, right? Now, that's not always true in the prophetic, but I'm saying Paul, even though he disciplined people, he sent trust and encouragement to them when he opened his letters because very few of Paul's epistles are not letters of discipline if you read them. Read Paul's 13 epistles, point out one to me, that's not, now there was uh, one with Philemon was kind of an encouragement thing, but 12 of 13, you need to read those. You really need to read those <laughs> and you'll be surprised at what those letters really are. And what do you think? Name some ways that you can fan the flame and stir up the gift God has given you. Be as specific as possible. Your sharing might help someone else. You first have to ask God what your gifting is. And you have to commit to not surrendering your gifting based on what other people think you should be doing. That is where we get into trouble. Here's an example of that. We get into trouble. You get into trouble when you let pastors and church leaders like me assign you to a ministry that you know good and darn well you're not equipped to carry out. But you want to be obedient. I got to be obedient to the man of God. Well, here's the problem. The problem is you have to choose between obedience to God and obedience to your church leader oftentimes because the Bible says, we know what the Bible says about shall I please men or God because if I shall please men, I shall not be the servant of Christ. Again, Paul. So even with us, we get over, I, I'm putting myself out there. I be wearing church leaders out, I know that, but I'm putting myself out there this time. Man, sometimes I wanna get the work done so bad that I'll leave people in place too long or I ask them to do stuff. And, and thank God now that our church is past that. Now, all of our office, we're a small church on field, but I don't care. I would rather have unfilled offices than pe the wrong people in there. Not that they're going to create chaos. That doesn't go on in our church. Nah, they know, they know we're going we gonna to have a meeting and we're doing some Matthew chapter 18 up in there. We ain't doing that. But the people that we do have are in the rights, are in the places God has for them. For instance, right now we, matter of fact, I can't remember the last time we had a Sunday school secretary or a Sunday school president. I can't remember. Or the last time we've had a president of choir. I can't remember because the reality is um, our choir didn't, you know, nobody right now want to step up and do that. And I'm not going to say, well, you be the choir president. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to tell somebody I need a president for a Sunday school for what? What do you need a, a Sunday school president for? What, what, what is that about? Where, where's that written in the Bible? Especially in a micro church, right? Well, our smaller churches, not only larger churches. God, I, I get that, man. Pastor, you know, pastor can't be doing everything. Pastor and pastor wife can't be doing everything. I get that. I want to be merciful there. But again, when we stir up the gifts, they have to be the gifts that God has given us and not what somebody else thinks that we should do. Work the call. Second Timothy 1, 7 through 10, King James Version. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor me of his prisoner. Be you a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us to a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purposes and grace. Again, it is by grace through, it is by, uh, grace through faith that we are saved. It is a free gift of God, not of works, lest any should boast. We don't work to be saved. I've told you we work because we are saved, right? 
In verse 10, but is now made manifest by the appearing of Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And what we what we understand here is you can't be ashamed of that gift that God has stirred up in you. And a lot of times people try to make us ashamed because they don't understand. I have dealt with that a lot. People don't um, have, have, have said I don't act like a pastor. I don't I'm, I'm kind of not sure what that means. Um, because I didn't necessarily grow up. I, I can't, you know, I was 16. I left you know, Baptist church. I, I wasn't back until I was a preacher many, many years later. So I didn't necessarily as adult come. And even then I was in non-denominational Baptist pastor, uh, pastor of a Baptist church. Now I'm not, you know, I'm not going <laughs> to take it further than that. But what I found out is I didn't come up in that culture. So I don't know what those expectations are. I have no, I now, I think I know now by being a pastor for some years and watching what other people expect with the way they dress, the shoes they wear, the singing, and um, the, the, all of that stuff, the niceties and the churchiness that goes along with it. I think that's what they're talking about, acting like a pastor. I'm not necessarily sure what that means, I guess, uh, from their purview. I'm not talking about biblically. But what I do know is that I'm not going to act like people think I should act. I'm going to be who God called me to be, and I'm challenging you to that as well. Fan the flame and stir up the gift, and if you are kicked out and rejected, you be kicked out and rejected. I'm resigned to the fact that I'm probably not going to be pastor in long, I, I, much long. I'm, I'm resigned to that fact, but I am not ever going to switch and change up to save something that God doesn't want me to have any longer anyway. So that's what you have to do. Amen. What do you think? Why are the trials and sufferings faced by modern belief, modern day believers? What are some of the specific fears that discourage people uh, from living uh, for God? And then we will uh, uh, go through these rest. What are the trials and sufferings faced by modern day believers? I, I must stay in the house, in the house of God because judgment begins there, right? When the trials and suffering faced by modern day believers are mostly persecution from other believers, a uh, bad treatment by other believers, uh, just the, the, all the false crap that goes on in the church in the name of Jesus. So when we talk about the specific fears that discourage people from living for God, because people want to get along, they don't want to uh, cut against the grain. And that doesn't just go for God's sheep. That also goes for leadership. Believe me, I am steeped in a culture. Now, that's not my bag. I don't care. I'm not going to try to be your friend. Uh, brother Peach, Brother Pastor, I don't care. You're not in charge. You think you are. You're not in charge. I don't care if they're the national president or the Baptist Convention, the state president, the youth, the moderators. They're not in charge. God is, right? So I'm not going to be who they think me they should be. So let me give an example of that. So they, it was interesting that I was in talks uh, with the general secretary of the Baptist Convention to uh, replace the current moderator. Yeah. And as the talks went on, I uh, had to repent uh, because God reminded me that there's nothing moderate about me. I am a, I'm black or white, heaven or hell. I can't, I've seen moderators in action and I don't have that gifting of middle ground, right? I'm gonna see their point and I'm gonna see this person's point which gonna try to meet in the middle. I don't try to join evil with good. I'm not trying to do that. I can't do that. If somebody right, I'm going to tell them. If somebody wrong, tell them. And what I told Brother General Secretary, our General Secretary, what I told Brother General Secretary was, man, I would be more problem, problems for you than I'm, I, I'm, but then I'm work. He now knows that, right? But again, and then he was like, okay, Adele. So, and then he, he was like, okay, can you do evangelism? No, I can't do evangelism. And the, the, because the reason is when I'm outside doing I'm outside calling uh, God's people back to him. I'm not out there like holding hands with people, like trying to convert them out there. That's not what God has me on the corner for. God has me on the corner, giving the entire world a warning. Now, if there's people that come up, I'll talk to them and this and that, but I'm not out there for that. God has other people much more effective than me that are out there doing that. My message is that. So the, the issue becomes, when we walk in those things, people will say that you're not acting as if they think you should act. It doesn't matter what they think. I don't care about being some moderator. Now, that's way out of my reach now <laughs> because of the thing. I don't care about being some moderator. I don't care about being a state president. I don't care about being in a National Baptist Convention. 
I don't care about pastoring a large church. I don't care about that. I will go somewhere where there are two or three believers and, and we can like, like get in a library. Or, I don't care about that. I care about being who God called me to be. And that's what you have to do as I close here and pray is you have to determine who is your master and who you want to please. Are you going to be who God called you to be? Or are you going to try to get in where you fit in? Because I've seen the value, even in church leadership, of fitting in. But the cost for fitting in is way too high for me. It means that I have to compromise truth. It has to compromise who I am. And I can't do that. I can't partner or be around people that God is calling me to point them back to him. Leaders, I, I, can't, I can't congregate with them. So I'm saying, are you willing to be an outcast and being trusted and encouraged by God today and being who he called you to be? You need to break out of that because what I have found out is this. What I was trying to fit in, and I did, God forgave me the first three years of pastoring. He had me silent because I was watching. I tried to fit in. I bought, you know, a pimp suit. Um, and, and it was so funny because I was at the altar and I, would, I got these shoes that the heels were kind of high. And I never tried to walk in those shoes. And I almost, you know, people's like, what's wrong with the pastor? And I told them, I said, Joe, I got to get these shoes off. I was trying to dress up. And they said, the whole church just broke out laughing because they was wondering what I was doing. But I tried to fit in. And all that ended up happening is in trying to fit in, my heart was broken. Because A, I compromised on some level. And B, uh, those people that God has sent me to because they, all, they thought I was one of them are now super angry at me when they found out I was not. So what I'm saying to you is you have to have the courage to live who God called you to be from jump. And if you don't know, don't act. Don't try to fit in. You don't always need to survey the landscape to be a, uh, an effective leader in the house of God. And it led me to compromise. I, a voice crying in the wilderness, got somebody God sent with the ministry of Amos and John the Baptist. I compromised trying to fit in. What will you do? Father God, in the name of Jesus, thank you for this lesson today. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for, uh, Lord, just the courage, Lord, for to admit uh, when I'm wrong and, Lord, to repent before your throne. Give your people the encouragement and trust and encourage. And I know you have God in their leadership role so they can trust and encourage the people underneath them. In Jesus' name, amen. And so be it.